Okay, so up next we've got Pablo Fountain. He is the water, are you the water director? Yeah, the water division manager. The water division manager. manager. Okay. So uh, I was asked to talk tonight, and it was kind of about atrazine. We've seen a little resurgence in atrazine out there in the in the lake and in the watershed. But I thought I'd take the opportunity to take a few extra minutes. I think this is the first time I've had the opportunity to be in front of this group. So just kind of introduce myself, throw a few more slides up here, and kind of come at this from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, we're talking about all the applications we can make out in the field, the farm fields with BMPs and stuff. But this is geared more to kind of try to explain to you why all this stuff is super important to us. So um, I'll go through, I think there's maybe 20 slides here, but 15 minutes or so, and then leave plenty of time for questions. So again, my name is Todd LaFountain. I've been with the utility for 28 years. Um, I've been in my current position for two. So I took over for Ted Meckes. So I started back in January of 95. So as it relates to this group, there are a couple big things going on in January of 95 on into the spring. Um, one of them was atrazine was huge. Atrazine, we were right there at the limit where we were gonna have to get, we were in danger of going on the IEPA's restricted status limit. So why that was huge at the time, not only, you know, obviously exceeding the MCL three parts per billion for atrazine is a huge issue for us personally trying, I mean, we're trying to deliver a compliant water all the time. Um, so it's huge on that level, but why it was huge for the economic community around here is what that meant is if we went on that, on that restricted status list, that meant no more main extensions. I think everybody here could probably remember back to 95, I mean, subdivisions were sprawling everywhere. There was development everywhere, not only here, but in Chatham and places like that would have been affected. So all that development you see on the west side of town would have been curtailed until we, we, we fixed the problem. So, so um, I'll go through, there's a couple other things that were happening. We were just coming fresh off the, the dredging of the lake in the late eighties. I went to Chatham. Spent a lot of my early years out there, so I got to see that dredging project through and, you know, kind of live not too far from where the spoils went from that dredging project. So that was super exciting. I was back in the era of where you drive over the, what we call the S curve there by the high school. And there was just a sea of lily pads. Everybody remember that where it was, I mean, we were literally six, eight inches deep in, in that end of the way. So it was exciting when the the dredging project came through for sure. So that's kind of my origins of where I started. Um, I worked for water distribution with CWLP for about seven years, then was out at the plant for, let's say, 26 years. And then I've been downtown there with Doug for two years. So been here, there, and everywhere with CWLP. So I, I plagiarized this slide from a power presentation that Tom Skelly put back together way back when, and it actually had reference Dick's name and Barb's name on it. But anyhow, um, you know, quality, quality, I'd add quantity to that probably, probably should add quantity to that as being important to us. But, but the reality of it is the lake itself, in my mind, is the biggest asset the community has, right? Having a reasonable quality source, sufficient quantity to supply the city, I mean, that is it. That's the biggest asset we have in our community. And when I think about that, it's like, all right, I tried to think of some other assets that would be of comparable importance. I really couldn't come up with any. So I, I throw that out there. And as we're going through the talk, you think of one to rival the lake. Uh, let's throw it out there and have, have a discussion on it. But, you know, I viewed it as from a, a perspective of, you know, the power industry do a lot of complex things, produce power. We, you know, have a billion, half billion dollar plant out there in, in, in Dalman 4, but our plant goes down, there's an alternate source of electricity, right? We have the infrastructure to bring that electricity into the city. Same with gas. We've got pan heat, we can bring gas into the city. And pretty much everything we can replace except for that lake. 
And without that, you know, there is no backup source right now. There's a sufficient quantity to get anywhere close, right? You can't go to Chatham and their 1 million gallon production wells, you know, aren't going to do us any good. Uh, Outer Lake, you know, with their small capacity isn't going to do us any good. This is it. This is it. So it's really important we take care of it. And, and that's why we appreciate you all be making these efforts out in the watershed. So another thing I went back and what, well, that's the next slide, but here you see a, like the slide of the lake and then of our uh, kind of a schematic of our water treatment plant. And so, like I said, I was out there since about 2000, 2001. So we put about $100 million into that treatment plant, making it one of the most sophisticated um, plants, you know, in the United States, kind of modernized the entire thing from beginning to end. Um, but it's not functional and it, it, it's not going to produce a quality product. We don't have a reasonable starting point. Lake. You know, I was thinking about this too. I uh, we went through a little taste and odor run last uh, last fall, and and I had a couple people internally say, you know, well, you're you're a treatment plant. Why don't you just remove whatever it is that is causing the musty taste, right? And the reality of it is, I probably thought the same way back going to school in the late '80s and '90s, right? We ought to be able to just knock everything out of the water that comes into the intake. But the, you know, the reality of a municipal treatment plant, whether it's here, California, wherever it is, is not designed to remove everything, right? It wouldn't be economical to do so, and it wouldn't even be what we would want to do as we're sending this product out through 700 miles of water distribution system. So I was moving, uh, helping move my son in Lawrence, Kansas this weekend, and of course, we get there and the water shut off and there's no electricity for the air conditioning. And, you know, it's a complete disaster, right? But so we go to the store and we get what I think is pretty economical, a gallon of distilled water, right? And to actually get two, one for him, one for me. And I thought we got a great price on it. It was like a buck fifty, right? So no more, no more, normally you go into these stores and you get like 16 ounce bottle of water. It's two and a half bucks or something. So then I start thinking about that, you know, like even if you could design and deionize water for the public at large, nobody could ever afford it, right? Even at that reduced rate of a buck fifty for a gallon, the average consumer uses maybe 100 to 150 gallons a day. So that's per capita per person. You're talking about $200 a day for, for water, right? You start doing that math, you just, you just couldn't produce water like that nor would you want to, right? A pH of seven water sending that out into cast iron main distribution system, you're gonna have all kinds of corrosion, your lead and copper issues, all those things are gonna be a factor. And you want some of these ions in the water that you send out to the public, right? You want fluoride for health, for uh, heat protection, dental protection, you want calcium, you want a variety of other ions in this water. So with that said, I'm super proud of this plant, right? And I'd love to take everybody on a tour and show, show everybody what we do there, whatever fit into the agenda for this group. But that said, probably the most sophisticated, the least understood, and the most important treatment piece that we've got is the lake. I mean, what you see at the far south reaches and the far west reaches of the lake, as far as quality, is very poor compared to what it ultimately becomes at the very north end of the lake. That treatment plant was strategized back in the 30s to sit at the very end of that huge detention base. That's why our job is so much easier than somebody that's got a, a treatment plant on the Mississippi River that's trying to treat this continuing flow of material that doesn't have the opportunity to let that uh, that water sit in that basin, let those biological activities really improve that quality. So we got a reasonable starting point. But there are limits to what the lake can do, and that's why this group's so important. The better it comes in and Lake and Sugar Creek, obviously, the better opportunity is going to improve throughout the lake, and the better chance we're going to have to continue to meet all our goals. So this was another slide that I kind of plagiarized, but back in the day, uh, 
Tom and Dick and Barb, they had four uh, criteria basically that were thrown up there in terms of what's important. We talk about water quality in the lake. Uh, these were actually, the font size was increased or decreased based on how important Tom thought those four, well, he had the first four of those criteria were. So he had sediment is very big coming right out of that $8 million dredging project in the late 80s, right? That was dear and dear to his heart. Atrazine had, you know, whatever, a couple points below font. Then he had nitrates and bacteria. I'll get into phosphorus, but this is one we're tracking a lot closer, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's becoming increasingly important, not only in Lake Springfield, but around the, around the mid, Midwest. So sedimentation, so again, that was huge, a huge bomb for Tom, right off that dredging project. And think about this in terms of where that dredging project in the 80s was, time-wise from the construction of the lake, maybe about 50 years in, after the construction of the lake, we're somewhere about 33. We're getting close again to needing to do something like that, right? Might be a decade off, decade and a half off, whatever it is, doing a major dredging project. But one of the things that uh, my predecessor, you know, Ted was always adamant about, well, we need to secure these, uh, this runoff from the fields and the sediment coming from the fields before we invest another 20, 30, 40 million dollars in dredging the lake. Dredging is tough. I mean, you don't get a lot of material out for the cost. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It's really, I would call it an inefficient when we talk about moving dirt out in civil engineering. It's very expensive for the volume of dirt you're able to move. So this is where I came in in the mid 90s. So uh, we, uh, at Razine, for those of you that weren't around then when this was a huge issue, uh, for the drinking water industry, the, the standard is three parts per billion, and it's a four quarter running average. So if any time during that four quarter running average, you're over three parts per billion, you go into this violation, uh, I guess, a Reno or uh, area. So we, uh, we were close. Uh, we were down to that last, that spring sampling period, and we had to, to bring those levels, bring that fourth quarter way down to actually meet or be below that three parts per billion level. So after that, you guys all got, I mean, I was at water distribution doing something entirely different, but you guys all went to work and, and did a variety of things to try to improve the atrazine levels in the raw atrazine levels in the lake. These were some of them. I'm sure you could cite many more of the things that were going on, but to alter the application process of the atrazine incorporated some alternative chemicals, although I think the community probably still thinks atrazine is a viable and a, and a good product. Um, incorporated buffer strips, and did some no-till methods of farming. And the reality of it is all that stuff takes time, and I, it's hard to explain that to somebody outside the industry too, is that what, what we do here takes decades for us to see the improvement, but, but it came, and I'll, I have a couple slides Showing that. So some of the things you guys did too is uh, do some field studies, you know, with and without filter strips. What kind of atrazine levels were running off some of these fields? I think it probably largely was to show the rest of your producers that it works, right? So and so, like I said, these things for us to see them, they take decades to take hold. And so about, about a decade later, again, you have to do the relative price of what, what carbon was back in 94 compared to now to make these make sense. But back in 94, in the, the heat, height of that problem, 94, 95, 96, you see those numbers in, in powdered activated carbon. What we spent to try to bring those atrazine levels down below that three part per billion threshold. And so I, I'll tell you this too. So Back in 94, carbon was about $550 a ton. Today, it's about $2,000 a ton. So, I mean, you could imagine those numbers would be a half million, three quarters of a million dollars if, if we were seeing levels similar to 94 through 96 at the intake structure. So, again, about a decade, it took us a you know, gradual downward, prop, uh, downward scale here. In 2004, we hit zero. So. 
Uh, we always feed some carbon. We usually feed three parts per million as background concentration. That's what we use for just kind of background tasted odor levels. So how these numbers are computed is when the atrazine levels are above that two parts per million level and we're feeding extra carbon to try to knock that level down, that incremental cost is what you see here. So, so that we did good, like 2004 through 2007, we really spent nothing that we could speak of in terms of extra money on carbon to knock down the atrazine. And then we had a few years where we spent a little bit of money and then, you know, we're almost forgetting that this was an issue again, 2014 through 2016. So now we've kind of been a little bit on the uptake recently in terms of what we're having to do to knock the atrazine out of the water. We see, we see some levels out there. Um, I guess the most recent level that was a, a spike was in 2021, I think it was about May of 2021 there, where you see that spike, we saw levels that exceeded basically 10 parts per billion. Again, I suppose you have to factor in the timing of the rains and the applications and all of those type of things or factors, but we hadn't seen a spike quite that high in a long, long time. So as we move on into 2022, we haven't seen anything nearly that high. Um, we've seen like threes and fours near the intake. We've seen like our eight parts per billion out in lick and sugar at times, but we've seen something close to three and four at the intake. But keep it in that, and keep that in mind too, that spike of 10 at that intake, that's a long way from the farm field. Phosphorus. Did anybody follow our, our little taste and odor run last September? Watch any of that on the news, hear about it? A lot of you probably are south of town. So, at any rate, uh, we had a little taste and odor run. It was a little bit more persistent than what we've had in the past. This is always something that happens with surface water bodies. Uh, it's caused by blue green algae. They die, they decay, they they produce a product called MIB and a product called geosmin as a result of the decay process. So one of the fuels for algae growth is phosphorus. So um, one of the proxies of the correlations that we, we use to see if we potentially would have a, a taste and odor, if we could anticipate a taste and odor run is the phosphorus levels. And so this is what we were seeing. Um, I, I would say the taste and odor run kind of lagged here by about a month, but that's what we were seeing in the lake in terms of phosphorus. We're seeing levels over 0.6. Keep in mind the raw water quality standard for phosphorus is 0.05. That's a lot. And so sometimes I get on the news and we talk about I talk about lake turnover and some things like that. And it's such a complicated uh, concept that it's really hard to boil that down into a 15 second sound bite. But what I believe is happening here is you've got all that legacy phosphorus from years and years that have settled on the bottom of the lake it's been carried to the north end of the lake in addition to what's being transported through the lake. When the lake turns over or when the water on the top in the fall becomes cooler, it wants to sink to the bottom of the lake and it kind of churns the whole basin. And so when that happens, it churns that phosphorus off the bottom of the lake. If all the other parameters out in the lake, including temperature, and sunlight and all of those things are just right. You get into one of these algae. So that's something we're tracking pretty closely. Not really a problem at the treatment plant. Once we bring it in, in terms of the phosphorus, hitting the phosphorus out of the water, it'll drop right out of the basins. But when we get the MIB, the geosmin is off product from these blue green algae blooms, we have a real tough time pulling out MIB. Geosmin will drop out. We, we, we go out and we try to buy the best carbon we can find and has the best adsorption ability for MIB, but it's really difficult to get that stuff out of the water once it's in the water. So again, phosphorus, important to keep out of the water. So bacteria, anybody remember this? Yes, this is it. So, and I was actually injured again, um, didn't compete in this, but I was watching this. And I was there on the side watching, watching this race, right? Um, so this kind of prompted a few things that would continue to today. Um, so we, we do 
monitoring out in the lake uh, for uh, E. coli. And then we post this information to the website, available for anybody that's a recreational user to see. Um, so these are numbers of E. coli in 100 mils. So it's the number of coliforming units, coliform forming units. So uh, what the what the user can do is they can compare this to the uh, bathing beach standard. So you shut down a beach at 235. So you can see again, you know, up in the upper for the west end of the lake, the, the south end of the lake, we've got some numbers that would exceed that. But the lake generally has better quality as you work your way to the north. So that was one of the big decision making uh, factors when they took that triathlon and moved it from out at uh, where the marina is today to Center Park. Is that if you get deeper, more north in the lake, the water quality is generally going to be better there. You're going to be below the bathing beach standard for E. coli, which is kind of the, and that's what uh, the industry uses to determine if there's a reasonable amount of risk out there for using the lake for recreational purposes. All right, nitrates, one of the final categories here. Um, we've had some scares with nitrates too. I know we've done a lot of work with that. And I went to a lot of the seminars when we're doing the end watch and all of those type of things. But one of the big things we got working for us here is natural denitrification cycle that happens in the lake. So you see, I'm going to call it the black bar and the purple bar. Those are at the uh, Lake and Sugar Creek and then the green bars at the intake. So we get that natural decay across the lake. So God willing, when once we get those high, if we get those high levels out west and out south, we've got enough time, residents time in the lake, those numbers will come down below the drinking water standard of 10 parts per million. One of the, the, the big issues with this is that uh, it's a, it's an acute type violation. So above 10 parts per million, you're immediately in another category where you got to go look at doing something for treatment, which Decatur did this years ago when they put in this plan to treat for nitrates and then they didn't use it for 15 years, 10 years. So they did such a good job out in the watershed, but, but that's why it's so imperative to stay below that. I mean, you could go invest $50 million in the infrastructure that's going to sit there and then your pop your your customer base has got to finance that. But some of our bigger scares there, you see, um, I want to say that was back one of them, about 2004 or five, something like that. We were up at about eight and a half parts at the intake. And then in 2013, I think it was, we're close to eight, maybe 7.8 at the intake. We go into our actual nitrification. Uh, I guess standard procedure warnings and things of that. Once we get in that four and five level, we start to go into this mode where we're looking at alternatives. And the, the big risks for this, if you have, if you're not familiar with them, are blue baby syndrome. It basically deprives a, a infant or a young child of oxygen, so it's an acute type violation. It's not chronic, something that occurs over time. So. And again, what are we doing and, and what are you helping us with to, to kind of combat some of these major issues in the lake and the watershed? So um, apart from what you're doing here, our, our uh, Lake Resources Department, they're, we're doing riprap and stabilization within the lake itself. We're trying, I think that came up earlier, we're trying to move all the, the houses on the lake to sanitary sewer. It's a, it's a slow process. It's a long way around the lake, and there isn't a trunk main close to a lot of these areas. So it's these low these low pressure sewers that go in these lanes. We only did four last year. I think we'll probably do 60, 65 this year. We're using some ARPA money um, to do Hawthorne Lane and Linden Lane. So those would be big gets if we're able to get that done. Um, the IRAP program, again, we go back to like the bacteria and stuff like that, and you know, trying to keep cattle away, stream beds and things of that nature, um, trying to reduce that deer population around the lake, trying to keep the bacteria count low. Um, some of the bacteria and viruses aren't a big deal to the treatment process, but some of them are. So cryptosporidium, if anybody's heard of that, it's a big issue in 
It was a big issue in Milwaukee a few years back. So this is something that's really resistant to chlorine. You don't pull it out with your filters, it doesn't possibly pass. And they actually had double digits and, and deaths out of a cryptosporidium instance in, in Milwaukee. So those are some of the type of things we're concerned about why we want to control the animal population out there in the watershed. And then, of course, the things that you guys are all experts on, the NWQI, the RCCP, IEPA grant, just trying to keep those nutrients out of the lake. So I think that's all I had, unless you have any questions. Yeah? Um, the last couple of slides, you can bar graph, the box. Which one do you want? Right there. Okay. So it is trying to figure out how to, like, in um, 2012, is it set to free high uh, nitrate load, uh, sugar free? Okay. Yeah, so so this would be, and I don't have specifics to share with you, but this would be the ultimate in what I tried to uh convey is you know, like the, the lake basin itself being our biggest asset as far as the treatment of the tool. If the lake is basically stagnant. I mean, that's good for a lot of reasons. Like this is it's good for nitrate treatment. Um, not good for some other things. It's not good for blue green algae and some other things. But and this would be probably an instance where we're moving lots of water through the lake, had lots of dam gates open, and the residence time in the lake is very short. So just to give you kind of a, I guess a scope of bookends on that. Um, and we've moved a full volume of lake in a couple of days before we've had five things now. So from one end to the other, we replaced the entire volume of the lake. If it just was gallon per gallon, if we pull a gallon out of the intake and we replace with a gallon of sugar, lake or sugar free, it would take something like two years to get from the outreaches to you know the truth is somewhere in between. It's usually in terms of months, two or three months, four months. Yeah, I, I will say first, everybody south of I-80 heard of the case of the little problem. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys are talking to everybody. All right, share me, share me a story. Share me a story about that. Uh, are you still doing the solar keys, or is that off the table of that whole thing? I avoided that topic. <laughs> 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 We're not. No, um, I pushed hard for the solar bees. Um, and I can go into that little spiel if everybody hadn't heard that, but it's uh, I pushed hard for the solar bees. You know, one thing that's changed about the, the nature of our lake is that the, the cooling water that was used by Dalman 31, 32, 33 moved about 300 million gallons a day of water on that end of the lake. Just kind of, I mean, it wasn't strategic mixing, but it was, mixing, <laughs> and it was at such a great volume, and there's so much thermal load added. That I think it did a pretty thorough job. And we, I guess our evidence of that is when we do profiles up and down the lake, it'd be pretty uniform most of the year. And now it stratifies just like a normal lake. Yep. And so you have your normal fall turnover and you have all those things that are, are uh, I guess, indicative of a normal Midwestern water source. So now we just didn't behave like that anytime before. But um, we were hard and feathered. Yes, uh, I definitely put the station. Yes, there's a link for that too. So oh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. You watched it. Were you there? Sure. No, but I heard a lot of people heard about it. I saw the flyers. There were the flyers and then the presentations, a YouTube video. Yeah, and it's uh, I, nobody that I've recommended it to has said, you know what, I stopped watching after 20 minutes. Everyone that I've recommended it to has watched it from. Minute zero to minute 140. <laughs> so I think it's like not quite two hours long, but it's over an hour and a half. Yeah, it's good times. <laughs> with, um, with the drug game, when they did it in the 80s, do you know if they um, did that activity, did it stir up more legacy phosphorus and then kind of spike? Anticipate that, like for the next time you drag it, drag it more the So, no, I don't have any quantitative data that would uh, be a Allow me to answer that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, some of the questions that came up is like altern alternates to the solar bees. Well, let's just dredge the lake. 
Yeah, that'd be nice if you could bridge the lake, but I mean, we're talking, I'm trying to remember who put the estimate together, but we're talking 30, 40, 50 million dollars to dredge the entire thing, maybe more now. I don't know. Just have deeper water that's not mixed for what the work is all phosphorus and pretty yeah. more helpful. Right. But I mean, there, there has been some thought, and I've thought about at times. I mean, strategically, right, your sediments down there at the south and the west ends of the lake, just like where we dredged before, and they're naturally filled in, and maybe it's three quarter or whatever filled in now down there. Um, which makes sense when you look at that timeline 33 years into it or 50 years into it before it's like not there but we're getting close um, but you know if you're strategically doing it you're trying to combat like blue green algae and stuff i mean if you go down to the north end or on the intake just do a small area and try to remove the phosphorus there that doesn't keep it from redepositing maybe it buys us five more years of relatively trouble-free operation so we've kicked those ideas around too. Yes. So, um, right. I was going to ask, um, has that been common in the lake? I mean, I, I would be surprised that with the um, um, money. So, yeah, I mean, we had a couple things. Yeah, we had some things. We, we've always had. Intermittent taste and odor. Um, usually, the short enough duration and of moderate intensity, where you know it's, they're here. Somebody might say, "Hey, I notice a little something," and then by the time they wake up, or you know, the weekend's over, it's gone. So the couple of things have changed. Um, like you said, I mean, the well, a couple of things that Springfield has been working for it was, I mean, we have the Clarity of the water is not real good. And usually these algae blooms like a little, I guess, water with more clarity. So, and that came up with the whole solar bee discussion. So they're going to make the whole lake more clear. No, they're not going to make it more, but we don't necessarily want that. Um, so the turbidity has been pretty high in the lake. So that's been working for us. And then the other thing, I mean, and this is just my conjecture, I wouldn't say if I didn't think it was true, was you know, we had that mixing and, and algae don't like. Moving water. Um, so, you know, all that mixing down at the north end where our intake is, we stopped doing that. We no longer circulate water for cooling purposes. Dalman 4 uses finished water and a cooling tower. Um, that movement of water went away. And the third component was the thermal. There's a certain temperature range that that algae really flourish in. It's really somewhere, let's say, 18 to 26 degrees C. A lot of time we'd be well above that. I mean, with the thermal load we were putting in the lake with the uh, power plant. So, yes, this one was way more intense, way longer in duration. And that was the reason that I recommended that we do something. That seems like our been more greater emphasis to trying to reduce the nutrients coming into the lake. Um, Watershed because you have less, um, other factors. Yeah, absolutely. If we could keep the nutrients in their entirety from coming into the lake like that, yeah, um, that would certainly minimize or eliminate the blooms. Um, but on a positive note, so I'll share one other thing. I know we're running up against time here. Um, so this particular group has got respect on a national scale. It really does. So I was out in um, Washington with the AWWA. They do a legislative alliance. So we go out there and campaign on all water-related issues. So we try to line up as many talks as we can with the legislators and senators and all that. And so Tracy Meehan out there, he's in charge of AWWA's legislative affairs. He's director of the Legislative Affairs National. And so someone introduced Tracy to me. It was the first time I met him. And he volleyed back with the introduction and said, Oh, yeah, Springfield. Yeah, you're there where the, you know, I mean, you've done these national level water resource type projects. And man, you guys are the best of the best. And so I just want to share that with you that this group has gained national acclaim for what we've done out there. So 
Thank you. you. What's that? Something to think about. Uh, on the farm, 